Although violent crime has been declining for many years, in some of Canada's poorest neighborhoods, gun violence is on the rise. Joining us now for more on what is behind the rise and how the gun culture has changed in Canada in recent years, we welcome Nadine Pequeniza, producer and director of the documentary Up in Arms, How the Gun Lobby is Changing Canada, and A.J. Somerset. He's author of Arms, the Culture and Credo of the Gun. And we're happy to have both of you in TVO. Welcome. Thanks, Steve. I saw the documentary, Nadine. It's excellent. I want to start with you. Uh, what's the big message you're trying to pass along through the doc? For me, the big message is, is that we, there's not an easy answer to gun violence. And if we're going to find solutions, I think we have, a, have to have a better understanding of what's happening, people's different perspectives, both gun owners and people who are victims of violent crime. And so in the documentary, I tried to interview as many people as possible to get those different perspectives in the film. It's a very balanced documentary, but I got a feeling I know where you're coming from on this issue. You want to tell us? Well, for me, I mean, People say guns don't cause crime, and that's absolutely true. But I think if you're trying to find solutions, you have to look at how is it that guns that are used in crimes ending up in those hands. And if you look at um, studies that have been done in the United States, and especially the United States because it's different state by state, the legislation, so you can see the trafficking of arms is coming from states where there is less regulation. What percentage of the guns that we have here come from stateside? In Toronto, it used to be 70. Now it's down to 50. In other cities, it's as high as 90 percent. So it really depends on where you are. Hmm. But in the United States, the study that I was referring to, it said that 10 states are responsible for 50 percent of the guns that are used in crimes. Hmm. So, and it's because of the legislation that exists there. Gotcha. AJ, you saw the flick? Yes, I did. What did you think of it? I, I thought it was very good. I thought it was uh, quite balanced. Um, sort of presents both sides and allows them to speak for themselves. I think sometimes uh, more than more than they should have spoken. Uh, I'm inferring from those comments that you think she gave them just enough rope to, write, you know, tie their own noose in some cases. Yes, I would say so. On which side of the debate? Um, well, the uh, on the pro-gun side, your your sports shooters, your pro-gun activists are, are the ones who are going to tie the noose and hang themselves. Were they so pro-gun as to make you uncomfortable watching them speak? Well, I wasn't uncomfortable watching them speak because I already know what these guys think. I'm already familiar with it. Uh, I am surprised they said some of the things they said or came out and did some of the things they did. Nadine, what inspired you to make this film in particular about this topic? I started in 2012 just after the Danzig shootings. And so that Just explain for people li living outside sure, Toronto the, what that is. The Danzig shooters was a shooting at a block party um, where 20 people were shot, 22 shot and two died. In Scarborough. In Scarborough. And so it was, uh, it was a departure from the level of violence that we'd seen before. There was a lot of talk, um, a lot of politicians getting involved and talk of gun bans, which is typically what happens after an incident like that. And then not long after that, there was the Sandy Hook incident. And so I was just looking and listening to the level of discussion, and I didn't really feel like there was a lot of nuance happening or a lot of um, deeper thinking, which I think you need uh, when you're trying to deal with gun violence, because the causal factors are multiple. It's very complex, and it's regulation's part of it, but it's not all of the answer. And just, again, some people will know Sandy Hook by a different name, Newtown, Connecticut, where how many kids at the end of the day were killed? 20. 20 kids and killed. six teachers. By a, was he a teenager or 20-year-old? I think he was 20. 20. Yeah. Okay, we've got a clip uh, that may help shed a little more amplification on what you've just been talking about, so why don't we run that now? Sheldon, if you wouldn't mind. And you shot? Never? I love newbies. Is it a right? Oh, Canadians are allowed to own guns? We didn't know that. For a lot of people, that's kind of surprising. Or a hazard. They were used in robberies, shootings, homicides, abductions, drug investigations. We still do lose you know, young people, far too often innocent bystanders, to gun violence in the city. The debate over guns in Canada is heating up. Background checks, background checks, background checks. The people say we need more gun control and to take our rights away will somehow make them happy. During a year of increased gun violence, find out where we're going and why. You can get a gun any way and how, it doesn't even matter, it's so simple. I don't want my taxpayer dollars wasted on useless legislation. 
There is no one thing to do. You have to reduce the demand for firearms. AJ, so much to unpack there. Of that very short clip, what are the images that jump out at you, that stay with you? The thing that uh, jumps out at me there is that sign, at the, which was at the SHOT Show, every gun owner must engage in the fight. And that's what these guys are doing, is you have a small number of people who have fairly radical views, and they control the gun lobby. They purport to speak for us all. And I say us all because I am a shooter, I'm a hunter, and a gun owner. Um, they, they claim to speak for us all, they go to Ottawa, and they also kind of bully people into line. So you're not allowed to speak out or you get all these people landing on you saying that you're helping the antis to win. You're letting down the team. Well, we know how powerful the National Rifle Association is in the United States. Are they trying to kind of replicate the political heft of that organization here in Canada? They would love to. They're not there yet. Oh, they're not nearly there yet because they don't have the membership for it. And there's also four different firearms rights groups at the moment. In Canada? In Canada. And they're all small and, uh, you know, they, they aren't joined together. Why don't they join together? They could have, obviously, a, a bigger voice if they did. Uh, there are some egos involved, I think. <laughs> you don't say. Yes. And that does happen from time to time. Um, can we play this other clip now, uh, Meredith? Yeah, let's, let's do this one here. This is John Evers, who we saw a brief snapshot of in that last clip there. Uh, Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Here's John talking about Sandy Hook that you just referenced a few moments ago. Let's roll that clip. These mass shootings that we see, a lot of them are happening with legally obtained guns. For example, Sandy Hook, right? So... I, I can see, I would differ on the... Uh, Sandy Hook was not committed with a legally obtained firearm. He had to kill his mother to get it. Well, it was so, his mom. He, right, so, but his mom... And you look at that situation, as tragic as it is, that's where she screwed up. If my children were unstable, would I have guns in the house? No, I would have no guns. My knives would be blunt and short. But not every guys. parent is able to recognize that right. because they so, could have their own mental health issues. With any society, there are risks. Living together, there are risks. And one of the penalties we have for living together are the Sandy Hooks. Does that mean I, I am willing to sacrifice these kindergartners on that altar of, of democracy or freedom? No. I'll try and prevent that, reduce as much as possible, but it is reality. It's sad as it is. We have a highway system. Cars go fast. People die on the highways. Should we get rid of highways? No, because the, the benefit of having a highway structure outweighs the cost of those deaths. We should remind everybody that uh, Up in Arms is on our website, tvo.org. If you missed it on television, it is online for your viewing pleasure. You hung out with him for quite a bit, eh? What'd you think of him? John's a very passionate person. Um, he's very committed to his beliefs. Uh, he loves a good argument. I, I don't know what AJ's experience has been with him, but I, I didn't mind being around him, you know? And I found there's real camaraderie in that group. I just don't happen to agree with all of their points of view. And what's interesting is I think John felt that, you know, as a filmmaker, I'm not arguing with people while I'm filming with them. I'm allowing them to express their points of view. And I think he was quite surprised that after two years of spending time together, I didn't agree with him. So he's very, he's very convinced of his point of view. But he didn't convince you. No. <laughs> What's, uh, wh wh where do you depart with him most significantly? I think that regulations do have an impact on crime, and not because guns cause crime, but because when there are other factors that all come into play, whether it's poverty or racial marginalization, unemployment, and there is accessibility to guns, it's, that's, that's what you need. That's the recipe for gun violence. And so what you want to try to do is have good regulations, regulations that make sense and are effective, that stop the transfer of guns into those communities. But if his argument is, you can pass all the laws and all the regulations you want, it's not going to make a bit of difference because we're the, we're the solid citizens who don't want to perpetuate criminal activity with guns. It's only when they get stolen from us or fenced over the borders or something, that's when you get into trouble and criminals aren't going to follow the law. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a certain logic to that point of view, isn't there? Yeah, but the logic to me is the reason they all come from the states is because they don't have the regulations that we have. That's why they're coming from there. So if we had less regulations here, then we'd have far more guns in the black market than we do already. 
AJ, as a gun owner, do you identify with John? Uh, no, I don't. Why not? That, to me, there's, uh, in order to have a civil discussion about firearms in society, we all have to be ready to acknowledge two truths. The first one is that uh, there's reasons people want to own guns, and it's legitimate to own guns. The second one is there's reasons why we want to regulate guns, and it's legitimate to regulate guns. And uh, people like uh, John Evers don't recognize that one. And this leads to real overheating of the rhetoric. Uh, you have some people saying, oh, there should be no guns, and then other people saying, oh, you're all trying to take away our rights. And he referred to rights in that clip. And mm -hmm. it's not a right in Canada, it's a privilege. We have to uh, sort of get together, lose the overheated rhetoric, and try as sort of people of goodwill to make compromises. Are most of the pro-gun people, people who live in rural Canada, most of the anti-gun people live in urban Canada, and therefore because 80% of Canada is urbanized, it's impossible for the 20 to convince the 80? I don't think so. I mean, I, I think there's a lot. I've met people who live in Toronto who own 150 guns. So there are, there are a lot of gun owners, collectors, sports shooters living in Toronto. A lot of them don't publicize it um, because they know that, you know, as AJ was saying, a lot of on the other side, there's the same rhetoric, you know, let's get rid of all guns, let's mm -hmm. disarm everybody, um, and that they think guns are evil, and they think guns are only used for violence when a lot of people use them for sports shooting and hunting, and, and there's nothing violent about that. Even taking hunting and sports shooting into account, do you think anybody needs to own 150 guns who lives at Young and Bloor? I personally am a little uncomfortable thinking that my neighbor might have 150 guns in their home. They're collectors, you know, they own historical pieces. So, look, that's why we need background checks and that's why we need regulations. If we're going to allow someone to have that kind of arsenal in their home, I definitely want regulations in place. Uh, how many guns do you own? Only three. And Not what kind are they? Uh, just a couple of shotguns and a rifle. Do you have an AK-47 or anything that repeats or that kind of thing? No, I do have an SKS, which is that that's the rifle that came before the AK-47. So is that a... a it's a semi-automatic semi -automatic. Uh, service rifle. And where do you live? In uh, London, Ontario. London, Ontario? Yeah. Fairly, I mean... In, in, in the city. In Not the in city. the center of the city, but in the city. In the yes. city. Okay. Why do you like to have the guns? Well, I mean, the, the main reason I have guns now is for hunting. Um, you don't uh, hunt in London, I assume. No, I, I don't okay. hunt in London, <laughs> as uh, people get a little excited about that. So uh, the rifle I own purely for target shooting. It's just a fun gun to go and, and uh, put holes in paper with. What is it about the actual pulling of that trigger, seeing the bullet fly out of the gun and hit a piece of paper that you find interesting? Well, as, as far as target shooting goes, I think a lot of people would be surprised by this, but I think of it as a very zen uh, activity. Um, it's all about concentration, it's all about self-control and so on. So it's not a sort of big violent, uh, you know, yeah, blow things up kind of thing. But um, there's a lot of that in the documentary. These weekend warrior guys who got three or four, what's that thing called, the three gun? Three gun shooting match. Three gun shooting match? Yeah. Where they're, I mean, they're, they look like they're FBI guys running and hitting targets and doing somersaults and all of this kind of stuff. Um, I don't think no one yeah. was somersaults. <laughs> Maybe not somersaults, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it looked pretty uh, G.I. Joe action-packed. Yeah. What would you think of that? Well, I mean, I used to, uh, I used to have friends who did that. Uh, not three-gun, they were IPSEC shooters, which is a similar thing. It's a pistol thing. Um, when I was in the military, and when I was in the military, you know, I liked that kind of thing too. It's kind of out of my system now. I, I don't have the urge to go and do it. Um, but I understand why people want to do it, because it's fun. I mean, they're having fun. And there's a lot of uh, sort of social disapproval or moral disapproval of the idea that you can have fun with guns, but you can have fun with guns. Uh, do you think some of that social disapproval comes because, you know, unlike car geeks who go to a car show and go ooh and ah over new cars, or consumer electronic geeks who go and see the newest Blackberry, the newest iPhone, and they go ooh and ah, guns are different. That's what a lot of people think. Guns are different. Yes, and I, I think they are different. I mean, uh, things like three gun are fun, but it is uh, a simulation of a sort of combat scenario. You're simulating shooting people, which yeah. is, this is one of the things that has bothered me about the, the gun culture 
in North America is the transformation from being primarily about hunting and target shooting and so on to uh, being about shooting people for various reasons, self-defense or defense against the government or defense against the zombie horde or whatever. Um, it's all about shooting people, which I think is troubling. It, and it, it speaks to a defective society where there's a defect in the way we see each other and relate to each other as we live together. Are you concerned about that as well? Well, in Canada, it's illegal to use a gun for self-defense, whereas in the United States, I think it's 67% of people, that's their reason for owning a gun. Um, even though it's illegal in Canada, there's a number of people who do have restricted gun licenses and do not belong to gun clubs, which means that they can't take their guns anywhere to shoot. They're only in their home. So that would suggest that some people do have them for self-defense. Um, and I did hear people speak of that, and, and you know, Paulette speaks of that in the documentary. So Paulette is the woman who owns the gun shop in Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. You know one thing I didn't see in this documentary? Mm. I didn't see you firing a firearm. Have you done it? I have, yeah, I It's have. not in the doc. No, <laughs> it's not. I have a friend, I had shot before I started this documentary, so I have a friend who is a, a shooter, and um, we went target shooting. And I understand what AJ's talking about. There's did you a like it? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. There's, you know, there's a breathing that has to go with it. You have to be calm and very focused, as he's saying, and concentrated. And, and it is relaxing in a way. I know it's, people talk about the power. Certainly when these guys are running around in the woods, you don't think of anything relaxing. But I wasn't running. I was just standing and pointing at a target. But did you feel powerful power? with this thing in your hand? No, I didn't. Hmm. I mean, I know a lot of people report that. I guess it depends on what you're thinking about. I was just focusing on the target and trying to hit it, so. AJ, you've written about the history of the gun lobby in Canada and the United States, and I wonder why you think gun culture has evolved the way it has in North America. Well, uh, I think that the really critical change comes in the 1960s, um, when I talk about there being a defect in the way we relate to each other and see each other, this starts to arise in the 1960s. And I suppose it's present beforehand. You know, racism and so on has always been a problem. Um, but what happens in the 1960s is people start to see their relationship with the state change. So everybody is now concerned about the government and sees the government as the enemy. So you don't want to... Uh, you're complaining about the man, you know, the police are no longer on your side, even if you live in the suburbs, uh, as I do, you know, you no longer see the police as your allies. That's a very American view. You think we, we have that same view in Canada now as well? Well, yeah, definitely I do. I mean, the Toronto Star has been running a series on uh, this week on the police uh, sort of misbehavior in Ontario. for sure. Yeah. Huh. Um, let's finish up on this. What did I not see in the documentary? that you shot? What ended up on the cutting room floor? There was a scene where we shot Tony, because Tony also, Tony, Ber Tony Bernardo of the CSSA, the Canadian uh, Sporting Shoots, <laughs> Sport Shootings Association, um, he represents not only gun owners, but also gun manufacturers. So we shot a scene with him um, for Stoker Canada, who is the uh, distributor of Beretta guns here in Canada. And they were, there's another piece of legislation that they've been fighting against, which is a marking system that the UN wants to put in place that has to deal with trying to track guns as they're imported and exported from different countries. We clearly saw in the documentary a lot of happiness expressed by Tony at the fact that uh, the Conservative government passed the firearms legislation that he wanted to see through. He pretty much wrote the bill himself, didn't he? I mean, pretty close to it. It's, by the looks of things. It seemed that way. I it, mean, and he said as much, really. Yeah. yeah. If, if one of the other two parties were to win this election, can you see any changes in that legislation or anything else for that matter going forward? There would have been changes. I mean, both the Liberals and the NDP were asking for changes in the bill, but they also liked certain parts of the bill. So they liked the fact that they made safety training mandatory. They liked the fact that they amalgamated, like they had two different kinds of licenses, which was possession only and now possession and acquisition license. It's all one now. So trying to get rid of a lot of the duplication, um, the red tape that, that gun owners complain about. And I think those are the things that we should be trying to do to make to win more um, favor and compromise between the two groups in order that we can have regulations that actually do do something. AJ, what would you like to have seen in the documentary that was not there? Oh, 
Not very much, really. But there's, there's one thing that we tend to ignore in Canada, and that's that our actually most, at, most at-risk communities for gun violence are in the far north, the inaccessible north, yeah. where everybody has guns because it's cheaper to fly in a box of uh, ammunition than it is to fly in a thousand pounds of meat. So, uh, and there are high levels of suicide and there are high levels of, of uh, shootings for various reasons. The highest murder rate in the country, although StatsCan likes to separate this because the small population distorts the numbers, but the highest murder rate in the country is in none of it. And this is something that Canada really needs to address. I want to thank both of you for coming in. We remind everybody, if you missed the documentary on TV, it's on our website, tvo.org. It's called Up in Arms. The filmmaker, Nadine Pequeniza, has been here, along with A.J. Somerset, the author of The Culture and the Credo of the Gun. My thanks to you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.